Good evening, y'all. Where should I stand? Maybe here? Is this okay? I want to be close to you. Y'all, it is such a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here with you tonight, truly. I, I come from Steubenville, Ohio. I serve with the National Eucharistic Congress, which means that what you have been doing here for 19 years, me and my team are, are just now trying to do for the rest of the country. And so we're, we're playing catch up. And it's just, it's such a privilege to be able to be a part of what God is doing here in this amazing diocese. And so again, thank you for letting me be here. And as I've been thinking and praying through this, this weekend and this opportunity, I am just filled with expectation and excitement for what God is doing. Tonight, I want to ease us into this weekend a bit. As tomorrow, I know we're going to have amazing moments of prayer and lectures and talks from spiritual and intellectual giants. Right? Sister and deacon and, and Dr. Bergsma, who was a professor of mine when I was a student. I mean, he's a hero. I'm, I'm more like a Dr. Seuss. But I'm thrilled to be here to, again, start this weekend in, in a place of prayer. And specifically today, I believe there's a special grace because you may not be aware of this. this. This isn't just a great feast day in our church. In American history, on September 8th, back in the 1500s, is when the first Mass was celebrated in St. Augustine, Florida. So just under 500 years ago today, the first time the Eucharist was celebrated in this country happened in Florida. And here we are still living in that grace and that reality. And so, again, it is a privilege and it is an honor. And let's just lean into that grace together. And so, if you will, let's just pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for your love and for your glory, for your goodness. And Lord, we pray that you just meet us here this weekend. You know where we are and you know what we need. And we just give you permission to move. Lord, I pray that you open our eyes to your goodness and to the reality of your love in our lives. And y'all as adults, I just give you a moment to just be with, with our Lord. Lift up your own intentions, your own prayers to our God. And if you will, say a prayer for me that I can be useful as a teacher. So Lord, we love you. Be with us. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you all the way from Steubenville, Ohio. I went to school there, but I didn't grow up there. In fact, I, I've moved around a bit, and I've moved around enough to know that I don't enjoy moving. And it's not just that, like, I don't like packing up. It's just that when I've moved, I've moved states. And when I was growing up in Ohio, I had to take a driver's license test, like most of you have. And the state of Ohio told me that for me to drive in the state of Ohio, I need glasses because my vision is pretty poor. And so that was the reality I knew. But what I didn't know is that when you move states, you need to get a new ID, which means you have to take another eye exam test. And I realized that after I graduated from college and I moved to Florida. And when I went to Florida, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was because Compared to the rest of the population, my eyes were still fairly young and strong. Maybe God healed me in that moment, but when I took my eye exam test in the state of Florida at the age of 22, the state of Florida disagreed with the state of Ohio, and they said, I didn't need glasses anymore. And so literally, I walked out of the DMV in Florida, and I never put my glasses on again. I lost them because I didn't need them. And I didn't even think about that until years later that God called me from Florida and he asked me to give up my flip-flops for cowboy boots as my family and I felt a call to move to Houston, Texas. And though we were excited, I was also nervous because I knew a new state meant a new driver's license, which meant another eye exam test. And I was going to have to somehow 
test to see if God actually healed my vision or whether Florida maybe was a little loose with their, with their laws. And I remember going to the DMV in Houston, and nobody likes going to the DMV anyways, but knowing that you have a stressful test ahead of you makes it all the worse. And I remember sitting there and I had some carrots because I heard those are good for your eyes, and I'm just waiting for my number to be called, and, and I'm in the South now. And I know about Southern hospitality because my wife's from New Orleans. And so I just figure maybe what I'll do is I'll go up to the lady across the desk of the DMV and I'll smile and I'll say y'all and maybe we'll just have a nice pleasant conversation and she'll just forget all about the eye exam test and I can get my license and get out of there. And finally after what seemed like an eternity of waiting, they call my number and I walk up to this desk and I try to do my whole charm thing. And before I can say anything of worth, the lady from across the counter says, third row, fourth column. And I wasn't really sure what she was talking about. And so I kind of smiled again. I was like, hi, I'm Chris. I think, and she goes, third row, fourth column. And I realized that she was already pushing me to the eye exam test. And I, I looked over next to me, and it wasn't one of those old kind of classic pieces of paper that you put on a wall where there's a big E and everything gets smaller. This was more like binoculars and you had to put your face into it and maybe you have that here. That was the first time I've ever had to do that. And so I put my, my head into this contraption and sure enough there's a grid and there's rows and columns and so I look for the third row and the fourth column just like she instructed and it is blurry. And so I'm sitting there with my face in this machine and I just think I've guessed on every other test I've ever taken. What's another one? And so I look at the first blurry line, and I think it's kind of squiggly, so I say E. The next one's a little straighter, so I say L. Next one's a little bit more round, so I say O. And then from across the counter, the woman goes again, third row, fourth column. And so I go back in, and I'm like, okay, maybe, I, 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 maybe that's not an E. Maybe, maybe that's a D. Maybe that's an I. And she goes, third row, fourth column, again, again. My wife is taking her eye exam next to me at this point, and she literally hits me, and she's like, knock it off. Everyone just thought I was dumb, and it was like the best thing ever. So I went back in again, and I realized on the third try, maybe there's numbers in here. And so I go, three, and the woman from across the counter goes, did you say three? And I just go right back in for a fourth time. I don't let her say anything. I just say C, and I start rattling off every letter I know. And then she says, okay, take a step back. And y'all, I kid you not, on the fourth try in the state of Texas, I passed my eye exam test. And I walked out of the DMV, and part of me felt proud of myself, but there was another part of me that realized my eyes really aren't that great. And so I made an appointment with the eye doctor and I got new lenses. And for the first time in years, putting on those lenses, I was driving through my hometown in Texas. And I realized, like, oh yeah, there's like words on those signs that I'm driving by. I remember pulling up to my house and thinking like, ugh, this needs, like, this needs paint. I remember looking at my wife and being like, you're beautiful. <laughs> yeah? like, and I realized that for years, for years, I thought I was seeing clearly. And then all of a sudden with new lenses, I realized all that I was missing before. And you might be thinking, why are we talking about that? What, what does that have to do with, with the Eucharistic Congress? And what does that have to do with, with the faith? Well, tonight, again, I want to ease us into this weekend. And so we're going to go back to the, the basics. And we're going to look at something very simple. And that's that God loves us. That's where we're starting this weekend. And I know that you know this. And you might be thinking, you flew here to tell me something I've heard since I was five? And I know it seems crazy. If I would say, do you know God loves you? You'd say yes, and you would get that right on a quiz. 
And we're going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about this. And yet, my hope is, and my prayer is, is that if we can just look at this love with new eyes, as John tells us in 1 John, that we might see the love that God bestows on us, that he calls us sons and daughters. That it may not just change the way we lean into the rest of this weekend, but it might change the way we live the rest of our lives. And here's the sneaky truth, is that even though we know this, and even though we've heard this before, we can't hear it enough. Because the reality is, is we're made for love. And I know that's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. Pithy sayings that don't have any weight just kind of disappear, but something like we're made for love actually sticks, and we've heard that before because the reality is is that we are made for love. Whether we know it or not, realize it or not, we're just going through our routines, most decisions we make are because we're driven by love and relationship. It's the way that we're wired. And though we're not going to do a deep dive into all of what that means, it's pretty obvious that love is the most important thing, specifically in moments when you don't have it or experience it. Or to put it another way, when we try to put other things in its place. The other day I was watching this television show, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. I don't know if you've seen it. You don't need to waste your time watching it. But it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's Jerry Seinfeld, just a great comedian, and he's driving around in a car with other comedians, and he gets coffee. And in this episode, he was driving around with Kevin Hart, who's one of the more successful comedians today. And they're just talking about life, and Kevin Hart came from the inner city of Philadelphia, and he was talking about how tough his life was and how he had to scrape to get to where he was. And as they were talking about it, Jerry Seinfeld looks at Kevin Hart and he said, you know, for you, hearing your story, you had it bad, and you worked so that things would be really good. But the struggle for your kids is that they have it really good and they're going to wonder why they feel like they have it so bad. And then they just go, let's go get coffee. And they just go away. And I'm like, no, that's the question. Like, why is that? That you could have all the success and all the money and all the fame and yet it's for the birds. Because we know deep down that the things of this world never really satisfy. And that we were made for connection. We were made for love. We were made for intimacy. And I'm not even talking theology yet. I'm just talking about basic human interaction. But we could take this a bit deeper. We could look at physiology. A couple years ago, there was this study in the UK. It was fascinating. These neurologists got up in front of a room of doctors, and on screens they put two different images of a child's brain. And on one side of the screen was this healthy, beautiful-looking image of a young person's brain, while on the other side it looked like it was diseased and malnourished. And as the neurologists stood up there and gave their presentation, the room was pretty floored when the doctors revealed that the healthy brain was of a child growing up in a loving, nurturing family, and the brain that looked diminished was of a child who was growing up in a house of neglect. That the lack of love literally changed the physiology of the child. Or we could look at psychology. There's something called the central relational paradox. And what that truth says in the world of psychology is that each and every one of us long to be fully seen and fully known so that we could be fully loved. And yet, according to the central relational paradox, at the core of man is a fear that if we're ever actually fully seen or fully known, we'll be found unworthy of love. And we're just talking about human love right now. But that's not where this conversation or this talk or this weekend stops. We're we're here to talk about the love of God, but we need to understand that our human longings, even as we connect with one another, and praise God that those of us here have at least one person that I believe that we can say that we love and who loves us back. 
most of us probably many, many more. But the reality is, is that oftentimes we fail to even love ourselves perfectly, and so human love will fail for the other as well, and that's why we need to turn our attention to the visions of God's love, what that means and what that looks like for us, and how do we best encounter that. And it's funny because when you start to talk about the love of God, and you start to ask questions like, well, how do you know God loves you, and, and how do you know that you love God, pretty soon you just start kind of going through the list of all the things that we do. And even as a teacher, that's where my mind kind of wanders. Like, well, here's all the things we need to do to encounter the love of God, or here's all the things we need to do to foster the love of God. And so if I would say, well, you love God, what does that mean to you? You might say, well, like, I pray every day. And I would say, that's fantastic. And you would say, well, and, and I serve people, and that's really good. And you might say, you only ris- listen to Christian radio, and that's good. Or you've never watched a rated R movie, and that's good too. And, and we come up with our list, and that's fine. But the struggle sometimes can be is that we get fixated more on the list than on the Lord. Do you know what I'm talking about? That sometimes we get so caught up with the spiritual to-dos and don'ts that we actually put the cart before the horse. And I want to make sure tonight that we look at that relationship and how to best cultivate that because there's a necessity to intimacy. And as we'll see in a bit, intimacy actually impacts activity. But we can't get that flipped around. I remember a few years ago, it was funny because I, I really was into my list. I really wanted to be holy. And, and maybe you can relate to this. I was, I was coming back from a retreat. It was a retreat for teenagers. I was just a chaperone. And it was, but it was like God's grace missed them and hit me. And, and I was just on fire with the Holy Spirit. And we we're coming back on this bus. And, and sure enough, we start talking about the love of God, which just automatically kind of turns to all these things that we're going to do or not do. And the teens are sleeping, but me and my friends are sitting in the front. We're just talking about what God did in our lives. We're we're making these promises to ourselves. Like, like I'm I'm never, I'm never going to sin again. You know, like, like I'm I'm, I'm going to love everyone I meet. I'm going to give away all my money. And we're just, we're making all these big, grand gestures. And I'm getting so excited about the love of God and the fact that I'm going to go home to my wife and to my kids and I'm going to share what God did in my life. And I kind of have this all built up in my head that I'm going to walk through the door and my wife who hasn't seen me for a few days is going to come up with maybe cookies or a sandwich and a drink. And, and I'm going to take her by the hand and gather my kids and we'll sit in the living room and I'll pull out the rosary and I'll tell them all about the love of God. And we'll sit there and pray together before we levitate to our bedrooms for a good night's rest. And I remember getting to the church parking lot and we unload the buses and the kids get picked up and, and I get in my car and I'm still on cloud nine and I turn my radio on to the Christian radio station. I'm still singing praises to God as I pull into my driveway and I remember I get to that front door and I open up the house and I walk in but nobody greets me. And I, there was no smell of cookies or food in the air but there was like an odor that I couldn't quite place. And, and we didn't have a big house, and so I, I, I couldn't really figure out where everybody was, and I was gone for a few days, so I was kind of surprised I didn't see anybody, even though the car was in the garage, and I finally find my family sprawled out in the guest room in the back of the house. While I was away, a stomach bug had gotten into the house and just took everybody down. And it wasn't what I was picturing. It wasn't something that I was thrilled to see or an encounter. But I knew that serving the sick is a corporal work of mercy. And so this is a chance for me to serve my family. And so I look at my wife and my kids laying on the floor and I say, Grace, kids, don't move. I'm going to run to the store. I'm going to get you medicine. I'm going to take care of you. And my wife looked at me and she goes, I haven't been outside in three days. You stay here and I'm going to leave. She's a very loving woman, but that was a little bit of a tough moment. Even for me in my my spiritual euphoria, I kind of felt some of that consolation leaving. I felt a little bit of tension. I thought, no, it's fine. She's a little irritable. All will be well. And so I, I get down on the ground, and I'm trying to, like, shake off that tough conversation with my wife. And a few moments later, she comes back in. I think, oh, maybe she's going to come to apologize. 
But instead of apologizing for her bad attitude, she, she looks at me and she goes, Chris, when I was backing out of the driveway, I hit your car. At that feeling, at that moment, sorry, the good feelings are gone, right? Everything I just learned, the goodness of God, all of my great moments and ambitions for, for wanting to live for God just out the window. And I run past her and I look at my car and my side view mirror is crushed on the ground and there's scrapes on this side of my car and she's trying to apologize and I'm just very upset and I still have kids inside who are sick but now I need to get my car fixed and so she's like I'll go I was like no I'll go because I won't hit anything you stay here now we're kind of going back and forth and so I pick up my mirror off the ground and I get in my car roll down my window I hold my mirror out and I back out of the driveway and the Christian music is still playing and literally, I kid you not, I say out loud, not now, Jesus. And I turn the dial of my radio. And true story, what song comes on the radio but R.E.M.'s old classic hit, Losing My Religion? <laughs> and it's a funny story now. And my wife and I think back on those five minutes and we thought that was really wild. But the truth is, is I had all of these really heartfelt desires to do good, to enter more deeply into a relationship with God, to pray more fervently, to experience God's more, more love deeply. And I didn't last five minutes before I was back to some of those old tendencies. And the thing is, is that when that happens and you're so caught up with your list, this thing that was meant to help you now becomes a source of guilt and shame. And it becomes really easy to just give up because you think, I can never live up to my own standards. And so what's the point? Or we go to the other extreme. Perhaps you go to a retreat or a conference or a congress and you get all fired up and you come up with your list, and because of your grit and your willpower, you do it all. You pray your rosary because you're that disciplined. You go to Mass because you have the time in your schedule. You take care of people and you smile even though you want to not smile. And though those things are all good, if it's just about the list, the danger on this side of the equation is that it can become a source of pride. And you start to look down on people who sin differently than you. Or those who didn't have quite the same skill set or desire or grit to live up to their list the way that you are able to. And maybe if you close your eyes and you imagine really, really hard, you could picture what it would look like for a Christian or for somebody to, to be at church all the time, but maybe, maybe seemingly have a cold heart towards others. If you really try to imagine that. Perhaps you could picture someone. And the reality is we see that all the time in Scripture, right? The Pharisees kind of had something like that going on. Judas followed Jesus for three years, and that didn't end up well for him. And I know that this is kind of strange because I just said, well, we have this list, and all those things are good, and so don't misread what I'm saying. But I know that it seems bleak right now because I say like, well, we have a list and we don't do it and we feel guilty or we have a list and we do do it and it becomes a source of pride. What I'm saying is that let's back away from the list and focus in on the Lord. Because the reality is when you look at Scripture, that's oftentimes the way people do it here. One of my favorite books in, in all of Scripture is the book of Ephesians. A couple years ago, I did a, I did a deep dive into this writing of Paul. And I was looking at different commentaries, and one called the book of Ephesians the queen of the epistles. Another said it was the sublimest communication ever made to man. Another called it the crown and climax of Paul's theology. And the fourth one said that this epistle, the epistle to the Ephesians, is the most comprehensive statement for Christology. 
And if you want to know what Chris Frank thinks about it, I thought it was pretty good. It was a great book. But as I started reading it and going slowly through the words of Paul, I realized something. That, that Paul has a little quirk. He has a little saying that he comes back to time and time again. So much so that, that it started to bother me. And I, I started to make marks in my Bible. And, and I'm, I'm an underliner. I'm a note taker. And I know you all can't see this. But if you could look and come close, you would see all these dots in the margins that I made any time he used this, this little phrase over and over and over again in the first few chapters of Ephesians. And it was simple. And yet it kept catching my eye. Paul would say the phrase, in Christ. If you look at Ephesians over and over again, verse 1, in Christ Jesus. Verse 3, in Christ. Verse 10, in Christ. Verse 11, in him. Verse 12, in him. Verse 13, in him. In him, in Christ, in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Over and over and over and over again. And he already has run-on sentences. And now I'm realizing his diction isn't that great. This wouldn't have passed my high school English teacher's grade book. And yet, all of a sudden, for me, it was taking me deep into this moment of prayer because I don't think it's accidental. For me, I think he, he's doing something unique here. It seems to me that, that where I oftentimes want to jump right to the practices, to the things that I got to do, he's speaking about a specific position a placement. He's talking about a nearness. He's not talking about where we go. He's talking about where we currently are. It's the difference between position and practice. And I think this is unique because we live in America. This is the American dream. We've grown up in a place that just says, well, we work hard. We put our nose to the grindstone and we just keep going and going and going and someday we accomplish something. If you want to be point guard on a basketball team, you practice and you earn your position. I don't know what that big, beautiful building is outside of here that's really tall and, and kind of brownish goldish. If I wanted those corner offices at the top, I'd have to work every day. I'd have to work really hard. I'd have to become the best in my field and beat out the competition, and then I would earn that placement. That's just the way America works. And yet, when it comes to our faith, it's something different. It's not our practice that earns our position. Our faith is not a meritocracy. Instead, it's our position that shows us how to practice. He's saying we got to get close to Jesus, that to be in him is where we start. Not with what we do, but where we are. That it's being close to the one who is perfect that perfects the way that we practice. Do you see it? It happens subtly, but over and over in the book of Ephesians. And again, if we kind of just step away from this for a second, it, it, it really puts things in context. Because if we were just going to talk about relationships in general, it would be silly to start with what you have to do for a relationship before you're in a relationship. If you met me when I was in college and you pointed to a girl named Grace, and you said, do you see that girl over there? And I would say, yes. You would say, do you like her? I'd say, she seems nice. She looks pretty. But then you would say something like, well, guess what? You can't talk to any more girls because of her. I would have thought that was insane. If you had said, wait, it gets better. All of your free time needs to be spent with her. It's like, what? And if you're just like, wait, 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 you're going to spend all of your money on her. I, I would think you were crazy. That, that, would, that would push me away from her. And yet, when I met this girl named Grace, the craziest thing started to happen. I, I didn't want to talk to other girls. I, I wanted to take what time I had and I wanted to spend with her. And I was happy to give whatever I had to make her happy. And if we fast-tracked, and y'all, I married up, 
But when my wife and I stood before our friends and our family and before God and professed our love and vowed our faithfulness and fidelity to one another, when we walked down that aisle for the first time as man and wife, we didn't go into a boardroom and start divvying out responsibilities. We didn't sit across from each other and say, you know, Grace, I'm not a great cook, so can you work on the sustenance for us? And I'll take out the trash, and in the rare occasion of a bear attack, I'll help there too. We didn't do that. When we walked down that aisle, we partied for a bit, and then we went to Puerto Rico. And we surfed, and we hiked, and we got to know each other, and I fell more in love with her. And the crazy thing is, is I now gladly take out the trash because I don't want my wife touching the trash. And I would gladly give my life for her because of my love. The intimacy impacts the activity. And this weekend, as we hear these great talks and as we think around these holy things and take these moments to dive deep into prayer, I don't want us to get distracted by the spectacle of it all. Because everything this weekend is driving us to know and to encounter God's love in a deep and intimate way. And that's what Paul wants for us in the book of Ephesians. Because as you go through Ephesians, in the first three chapters, there's just one command. It's, it's fascinating. He just talks about Jesus. And that one command is just to remember Jesus. Remember what he did. Remember that he, he made a home for you. But before Paul moves to the back half of the book, he stops and he says a prayer. And in chapter 3, he says this. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Here's where it gets good. That's just all one sentence again. Kind of run on. But we'll get through it together. Because Paul says that you, being rooted and grounded in love may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, and that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Did you catch that prayer? Ultimately, he says, I, just, I get on my knees and I pray for you that you may somehow, rooted in love, come to understand the width and the length, the height and the depth of God's love. And by the way, it goes beyond understanding, but somehow, miraculously, I pray that you might come to understand how much God loves you. That's his prayer. And after he prays that, he moves into the back half of the book. Again, in the first three chapters, one command. Remember who Jesus is. The last three chapters, 41 commands. Because intimacy impacts activity. And the question for us then becomes, well, what does that mean? Like, practically. Like, how do we live that? How do we see that? And that's ultimately the question, right? Because you have people like Mother Teresa... She said this. She said, when you see how much God is in love with you, then you can only live your life radiating in that love. I love quotes like this. But it begs the question, how? <laughs> like, how? Like, I want to see it. I want to know it. I want to experience it. And that's the beauty of our God. It's that he's a God of mystery, but he's not one of secrets. And that his love is available to us. Specifically this weekend, we get to celebrate that through the reality of the Eucharist. Where God is present to us. As our theme says, that he will never leave us. Or as Fulton Sheen so eloquently said, 
the greatest love story is contained in a tiny white host. The question is, do we have eyes to see? For me, the reality is, is for a long part of my life, a major part of my life, I didn't. I grew up in, in a Catholic home with loving parents, siblings, a dog, living the American dream, everything you'd expect for a boy growing up in the Midwest. And we went to church most of the time. And as my parents got more into the faith, we prayed rosaries together. But for me, I think you could sum up my relationship with God growing up was that, that I believed in God, but I didn't believe God. Does that make sense? I, I believe there was a God. Something doesn't come from nothing. It made sense that there was a first mover. And there was a creator. But when I would hear something like, well, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all might be saved, I would think, ah... I don't know if that really applies to me. Maybe that applies to, to you, the people who come to a Congress on a Friday night and want to hear a talk about Jesus. That makes sense for people like you, but, but for me, knowing my sins and my temptations and my shortcomings, I, I, I don't know. And so I, I believed in God, but I didn't always believe God. And so when I was in high school, I didn't really live for him. I didn't care to learn about him. I didn't really want anything to do with him because I thought at best God wouldn't love me. He would just choose to tolerate me. And that wasn't good enough. And so I just kind of wrote him off. But I'm lucky in so far that, that I had a religion teacher and a soccer coach who perhaps saw something in me that, that I didn't see myself. And again, I say he was my soccer coach because that's an important part of this story. I was a good kid, but I was prone to want attention. Still am. And so when I would go to his class, I would, I would act up like most classes, but he would actually give me detentions. But the thing with him was that I didn't really mind because as my soccer coach, I would go to detention, he would just show me videos of Pele, who was maybe one of the greatest soccer players of all time. And so I would act up in class, I'd make my friends laugh, I would get in trouble, but I would show up to detention for my punishment, and I would just essentially have a private soccer session with my coach. And I didn't realize at the time, I thought we were just talking soccer, but we were starting to build some camaraderie. He probably knew what he was doing the entire time, but as a 16 or 17 year old, I was blind to it. And I definitely wasn't bright enough to think that after soccer season, perhaps the soccer videos would stop as well. But I remember I showed up one day to detention as was my routine as a high school student. And I sat down in my typical chair and I looked up and there was no more screen. And there was definitely not going to be any videos of Pele. And instead, my teacher just came and sat down next to me. And it was one of those moments, maybe you know what I'm talking about, where it's silent, but you know a conversation's coming. The other person's just gearing up to say something, and you don't know how you know, but you know it's going to be a little uncomfortable. And so I'm just sitting there, and for the first time in a while, I kind of realized, oh, he's a teacher, I'm a student. And I think maybe here comes, here comes the hammer. He's going to tell me that I'm a delinquent. He's going to tell me I'm trouble. He's now annoyed with my antics. But instead, he just looks at me and he just says, Chris, how's God loving you? Now, granted, I went to a Catholic school. Like I said, my parents dragged me to Mass on most weekends. I was familiar with most of the prayers. Again, this is an easy topic. God's love? I would have got that right on the quiz. But when somebody asked me personally, how is he loving me? There in that moment, I realized I didn't really have an answer. I don't remember what I said. I probably said something kind of cheeky and, and kind of got out of the situation. But I remember on home that night, and I was really frustrated. Like, how can I not know how God loves me? As a 17-year-old, I wanted to know, how is God loving me? What does that mean? What does that look like? How do I see that and experience that? Is it more than just the textbooks I'm forced to read at school? Is it more than just the prayers that I have to pray on Sunday? How do I know what God's love looks like in my life? And I remember that night I, I said a prayer that, though it wasn't the first prayer I ever prayed, definitely felt like the first sincere one. 
And I simply said, God, if, if you love me, you got to show me. Because I, I don't know. And lightning bolts didn't fill my room, and there was no apparition, and I didn't hear any voice. I just went to bed. But the next day I prayed again, the same thing, and I realized as I went to school, I started actually paying attention in class because I wanted an answer to how God loves me, and maybe I thought I would hear it somewhere in the classroom. I, I went to Mass, and I, I listened to the homily, thinking like maybe I'll get some inside information here to how I can find God's love. And Again, I was 17, and, and I don't quite remember all the steps of that journey at this point, and I don't quite remember when exactly I found that answer, but y'all, I found something so much better than an answer. I found a person. I found Jesus, a God who loves me. At some point, the reality of who God was dawned on me, and all those things I thought was important as a 17-year-old started to grow strangely dim as I started to realize that I'm not just tolerated, that I am seen and I am known, and despite all the things that that means, I am still fully loved. And when that truth hit me, it changed the way I wanted to live. It changed my heart and the way that I approach God. That once I found the intimacy that we have a God who doesn't come to berate but to embrace, that we have a God who is far more prone to forgive than we are prone to sin, when we have a God who is consistent, even though people like me are consistently inconsistent, when I found a God who would give his only begotten son, take me on at my worst and offer me nothing but his best, how could I not return that great love with my own? And if God can do that in my life, How much more can you do that in yours and in others? That when we see the goodness of God for who he is and what he's done, it changes us, transforms us from the inside out because there's a necessity to intimacy and that relationship transcends the rules the list is replaced by a Lord. And all the information is a gateway to deeper intimacy. And that's the hope for us this weekend. If we have eyes to see. If we can see through a new lens. I was trying to think of, of some way to encapsulate what this would look like for us. Like, what, what could this be if we, if we see the love of God differently, if we could see our God in new eyes? And I thought of a story, but I'm going to ask for your forgiveness before I even share it, because I oftentimes like to share stories that, that reveal the goober that I really am. But I thought of this, this moment a few years back. See, I live in Steubenville, Ohio, and, and I'm very privileged that I get to serve the church, and I do that in various capacities, but in some places like here, I get to go and actually get to teach and share. And I was asked to go and do something like this somewhere else at one point. And I remember that day, my wife was just having, again, just, just a long day. It was just one of those weekends, one of those days. And she is alongside of, with me in this journey, but she knows that when I teach, she's at home with our children and, and we have a whole litter of them. And so I have a 12-year-old, I have an 11-year-old, I have a 9-year-old, my boy, I just call him boy. I have a 7-year-old, pray for her conversion. And then I have a 3-year-old, and we have one more on the way now. But on this specific weekend, my 11-year-old was being specifically difficult. And... I just realized that I wasn't going to get to leave and have my wife take care of those five kids and come back and have everybody be okay. 
And so I looked at my daughter who was being problematic, and I said, you need Jesus, you're coming with me. And I put her in the car, and she was frustrated, and she was upset, and she was kicking and screaming the whole way there. She was probably only eight at the time. And I remember we got into a room. It was a little smaller than this, but, but it, was, it was filled with, with quite a few people. And, and I put her in the back in a chair, and I said, you need to sit here, and you need to be good. Daddy needs to go behind the stage, and you're going to see me up there in a few minutes, but don't move. I'm going to come back and find you once I'm done. And, you know, the room was kind of dark, and there was a band, and she was kind of captivated by that, but she was still in an ornery mood, so I wasn't really sure what was going to happen, but I had to give a talk. And so, so I went backstage, and I just said a prayer that she would be fine out there by herself, and the band stops playing, and I go out, and I give a talk, and we end the talk, and the band comes back up, and we're moving into a time of prayer. And so I get off the stage and go, and I find my daughter, and she's still sitting there in that same spot. And at this point, we're moving into a time of adoration, and so I'm focused on the stage and the altar and, and now the monstrance, praising our, our God and our Savior. And, and I realize there in that moment, my, my daughter is just staring right at me about this close to my face. And I kind of look at her, and I'm like, are, are you okay? And she just looks at me, and she whispers. She goes, you're on the stage. And I was like, yeah, I, I know. And she goes, people were listening to you. <laughs> I was like, I know, it's weird, right? And she goes, they were laughing. I was like, I know. And then she just snuggled up. And I'll never forget it. She just kind of grabbed my arm and she just kind of started petting me. And what happened there? I was still the same guy that she was mad at an hour earlier. I was the same dad that makes her roll her eyes when I walk by because I say some corny joke. It was just there in that moment for whatever reason because she saw me in a new place in her little mind, I was painted with new colors. And it changed the way that she approached me. How much more would our hearts and our lives change if we could see God in all of his splendor and all of his goodness and all of his grace? I don't know the answer, but my hope is that this weekend is when we find out. See, I've done enough of these to know that in a few weeks you'll probably forget my name. You might forget the other speakers' names too. You'll, you'll probably even forget some of what we said, though you might remember little nuggets. And perhaps whatever you buy from the vendors will be put on a shelf and you might forget about it for a while. And all that is fine, and all that is normal, and I don't say that to guilt you or shame you at all. But what if, even if we forget the names of the speakers, we forget about the schedule that we all partook in, we forget about the things that we bought, and we forget about some of the things we heard, but we look back on this weekend... September 8th and 9th, 2023, as being the weekend that we saw God with new eyes, that his love came into our life with a new zeal and a new reality that changed the way we became church. That the intimacy we experience with God impacts the way we serve others. That's my prayer for us. And if you're willing, I invite you into that prayer with me as well. We have a great day lined up tomorrow. But let's not forget as we come back and this room fills with more and more people that we're here to experience the love of God, specifically through the gift of the Eucharist, for God to love the world that he gave his only son. The cross reveals that truth. The Eucharist reveals that God to love the world that Jesus was willing to stay. And so tomorrow as we come back into this space, 
Let's come back with fresh eyes and an expectancy to see God's love move amongst us. Amen? amen. Let me pray for us. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So Father God, we love you. And Lord, we pray for your blessing over this weekend. We thank you for what you're doing and we thank you in advance for what you will continue to do tomorrow. But Lord, we just pray that, that your love may become real and that our hearts may be open to receive your love in a new way. Mother Mary, in a special way, we ask that you just intercede for us, that you just may wrap this place in your mantle of love and protection and bring us closer to the love of your Son. So together we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thou womb, Jesus. Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all.